Welcome to part three, the final part of our three-week message series titled, How to Wreck Your Marriage, A Practical Guide to Marital Sabotage and How to Avoid It. We're looking at some of the behaviors and habits that can work their way into any marriage and cause real problems. And then we're looking at better alternatives to those destructive behaviors and habits. If you're married, then you know that we need these regular reminders to keep us on track uh, and continue us in the process of building a healthy and happy marriage. If you're not married, this series is just as important because it will give you a vision for your future marriage and hopefully help you avoid uh, much pain and some of the classic mistakes that are made in marriage and help you build from the beginning a healthy and happy marriage. And I realize that quite a bit of the stuff we've been talking about in this series has been uh, pretty heavy. And usually when you do a marriage series, if you're a, if you're a pastor, it's a great chance to just have fun and laugh about the differences between men and women. And this series hasn't really been like that. It's been pretty heavy, and, and the reason is because I just uh, have been feeling that marriages aren't really falling apart because couples can't agree about which way the toilet paper should roll off the roll. That's not really what's destroying marriages, not just because that's not really even a discussion. If you're a civilized human being, you go over the top and everybody knows that. It's not, not a discussion at all. Praise Jesus. There's redeemed people in the building this evening. I believe it and receive it. And so while this makes for some some heavy conversation topics. It's also hopefully illuminating and, and helpful. So, so let's jump in. The first one, you can write this down in your outlines. Marriage wrecking tip number seven in our series is refuse to change who you are. Refuse to change who you are. Listen, just because you're now sharing your life with another person, it doesn't mean you have to change. You, you need to be your authentic self. You do you. Just stay true to yourself. This is a hugely popular philosophy in Western culture. The idea that you need to be who you naturally are as much as possible. Not a new idea. However, there is a major major problem with this belief. There's a huge presupposition behind it. Presupposition is just a presupposed belief that is implied by this philosophy. What's the presupposition? This is the problem. The idea that you just need to be who you naturally are as much as possible presupposes that who you are naturally is great and doesn't need to change. That's the presupposition. And I hate to be the one to break this to you, but it's not true. It's not even close to true. You're not naturally great. Neither am I. And you do need to change. And so do I. The entire reason that Jesus came to the earth, died, and rose again is because we weren't good enough, right? That's the entire message of the gospel. We were not good enough to have a relationship with God, and we needed to be changed to become more like Jesus, and it's a process that we could not accomplish ourselves. Jesus didn't come down to say, hey, just here to share a message and let you know you are so great just the way you are. Don't change a thing, baby. That wasn't what Jesus came to the earth to say. And from the moment you give your life to Jesus, if you're a Christian, you should know this, the moment you give your life to Jesus, a process starts that's called sanctification. Sanctification is the work the Holy Spirit does in your life toward what end? Changing you to become more like Jesus and less like who you naturally want to be. Because you and I are born sinful and we're naturally drawn towards sin. Sanctification is the complete opposite process. It's the process of us becoming more like Jesus. And it lasts for our entire Christian life on this earth. And it reaches its fulfillment in heaven when we are made, as the Bible says, like him. Like Jesus. So the idea of us needing to change and being changed is central to the Christian life. It's completely antithetical to buy into the gospel that says you just need to be your natural self as much as possible. Where is that in the Bible? It's nowhere because it's not true. And one of the very best ways that God has chosen to accomplish the process of sanctification is through marriage. 
More than one marriage expert has wisely observed that the primary purpose of marriage is not our happiness, but rather our sanctification, the process of being made more like Jesus. And as we allow God to do his work in us, we become happier in our marriage. We become more satisfied in our marriage. So write that down. The primary purpose of marriage is sanctification. Just as the primary purpose of life is not happiness, the primary purpose of life is becoming more like Jesus and bringing him glory through our lives. That's what we're here to do. Nowhere in the Bible does it say the primary goal of life is your happiness, my happiness. And the reason is because becoming more like Jesus is the thing that will benefit us most for all eternity. It's the thing that will make us ultimately happiest for the greatest amount of time. Marriage is one of our greatest and most consistent opportunities to lay down our lives in service to someone else, just as Jesus modeled by laying down his life for us. Marriage is not about two awesome people getting together so that they can become awesome squared. Marriage is two sinners getting together to become more like Jesus together, often helping each other along that process, willingly or unwillingly. And if you don't believe that you need to change in your marriage, then you don't understand the Christian life. You don't get it. You don't get what's supposed to happen. You need to change. I need to change. Do you remember what we read last week from Ephesians? It said, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And then it said, husbands, love your wives wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Do you realize that neither of those things come naturally to you or I? That's why he had to put them in the Bible. He wasn't like, I know you're already doing this, but, you know, I'm just going to put it in here. I need to fill a few pages and lines. Wives, you do not naturally desire to submit to your husbands. Husbands, you do not naturally desire to lay down your life and your preferences for your wife. We need to be changed by the Holy Spirit and made more like Jesus because what we're supposed to be, we naturally are not. In marriage, you're going to need to change. You're going to need to compromise. And we don't get to say, I don't do that or that's not me. The question and issue is the same that we mentioned last week. The question is, what's the Lord asking me to do? Not what do I want to do. What is the Lord asking me to do? Your authentic self and my authentic self is is sinful. Completely, completely sinful. I don't want to be my authentic self because I know my authentic self. I'm fully aware of what my authentic self is. And I'm so grateful for the work that Jesus has done in my life to move me further away from my authentic self because I know who I really am and you know who you really are. And you don't want anybody in this room to know who you really are. You want them to know what Jesus has done in your life. And don't worry, the good news is that your marriage will give you endless opportunities to change and become more like Jesus. If you feel like you've missed an opportunity, don't worry, there'll be one on the drive home, I guarantee it. Marriage wrecking tip number eight. Write this down. Try to change your spouse. This is a great way to wreck your marriage. Try to change your spouse. You know, for a while, when we were living in the States, Charlene and I used to watch these these shows where people flipped homes for, for huge profit. And the plot lines, you know, it's always the same. They find a house that has huge potential, but it was really in rough shape. And then they sort of get to work. They renovate the whole thing, and they produce an absolute gem of a home that would then sell for a significant profit. Or at least that's the plan, right? There are some people who get into marriages with the same mindset. They see someone with huge potential, but some rough areas, and they think, you know what? That's no big deal. Once we're married, I'll be able to renovate those rough areas, smooth them out, and I'll end up with a gem of a spouse. And everyone else will think, I can't believe I missed all the potential of him or all the potential of her. Now let me speak first to to those who are not currently married, and then I'll speak to those who currently are. If you're not currently married, let me be as clear as possible. If you don't love who someone is right now, you should never marry them hoping that they will change in the future. 
Because even though you think you do, you do not have that kind of power over anybody. If they can't change before you're married, when they're motivated, when they'd like to be married, when they're chasing a goal, there's very little chance they're going to change after they're married. Sometimes in those TV shows, the person who bought the home would find out that they had made a a catastrophic mistake and the damage to the home was actually far worse than they had first realized. And sometimes the issues related to the very foundation of the home and no matter what, they were going to end up losing. When you marry someone who's not a believer, that's what you're doing. You're buying the house with the broken foundation. And maybe by some miracle, the foundation will be fixable. But sometimes all it means is that the whole house is going to end up being demolished because it's not repairable. When you marry a non-believer with the belief that you'll simply win them to Jesus, you're making the assumption that you will be able to be the Holy Spirit in their life. They might have resisted the Holy Spirit up to now, but they haven't met you. You're more convincing than the Holy Spirit. And that's a dangerous assumption. And as a pastor, I I just can't tell you how painful it is to watch someone who genuinely loves Jesus make that mistake and then have to live out their marriage in the painful state of not being able to share the most important thing in their life with their spouse. It's a tragedy, it's heartbreaking. And I always feel an obligation to share this when the subject comes up because especially in Western culture, we're in an age of, of misinterpreted and misapplied grace in the church. If there's any way we can agree with someone or enable their sin, we do it because we think that grace is telling people that whatever they're doing is great and they should keep doing it. That's the, that's the age we're living in right now in general um, in the church. And I encounter a lot of believers, a shocking number of mature believers who've been serving the Lord for a long time who don't think it's a big deal for a believer to date a non-believer. They don't, don't think it's a big deal. Well, they were the only person who asked them out. Or, uh, it's not really that big of a deal. And I want to read to you from 2 Corinthians 6 where the Apostle Paul writes about this subject. And and I just want to ask you, if you're a believer and you believe that the Bible is the word of God, as I read this, you discern if the Bible's being clear and emphatic on this issue or kind of vague and open to interpretation. You decide. Well, let the word speak for itself. Paul says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? That's another name for Satan. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. So what do we think? Is that clear? Or is that vague? It's crystal clear. Believers are not to marry non-believers. There's no asterisk that says if they're a really great guy or if they're really close. There's no room for that. There's no room for that interpretation. Even if you think you'll be able to win them to Jesus. Read the Old Testament. Missionary marriages didn't ever work for the Israelites, the people of God. All that ended up happening was that their faith was weakened and within one generation it was completely destroyed and the whole land was covered with idolatry and people turning their backs on God. It never worked. The Old Testament has that story recorded again and again and again and again and again and again and again. But we come along and we decide, no, 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 it's not that big of a deal. I know God is patient, but I wouldn't blame him if he's in heaven saying, like, are are you kidding me? I recorded that story in the Old Testament like a hundred times in a row, telling them don't marry non-believers, then they marry them, and it brings destruction and curses over and over again. And you guys are like, maybe I'll marry a non-believer. Yeah, he's a good guy. I've met him. (laughs) It must drive the Lord absolutely crazy if he wasn't infinitely patient and didn't already know that we were all going to do that. Now, If you are currently married, you need to recognize that none of us can change anybody else. Genuine change in anybody's life usually only happens two ways. It's forced upon them or it's invited in. And since I think that in our marriages we'd like to all agree, I hope, that it's not our goal to force change upon our spouse by, you know, tying them to a chair and brainwashing them. Since that option's not on the table, 
and some of you are thinking it's not. No, it, it's not on the table. The only other option is, is that change has to be invited in. And we see this and we recognize this even in our own relationship with the Lord where we can choose to resist his work in our lives, right? And we've probably all got stories where we knew that the Lord was trying to change us, but we didn't actually change till we stopped resisting and said, yeah, do what you want to do, God. I'm, I'm good with it. I'm going to obey you. I'm going to follow you. We can resist God and not invite his Holy Spirit to do his work in us. Change has to be invited in. Does that mean your spouse can never change? Well, not at all. But it means that God has to be the one driving the change, and we can encourage that through prayer. And the great thing about prayer is that it changes what we ask for. Because we know that we can't pray, Lord, please help my spouse to always do the right thing, which is agree with me. We know that we can't pray that, right? So that might be what we really want, but we know we can't ask God to do that, and so we're forced to pray something better like, Lord, please help my spouse to live fully for you. Help them to do what's pleasing to you, what is right in your sight. And now as we, we pray, we begin to change too because we stop simply desiring that the things we want would happen and we start praying for the will of God in a situation. And that's a very, very different thing. Prayer changes us, and it brings us into alignment with the will of God. That's why it's so powerful. But we got to remember that you and I are not God. We're not the Holy Spirit. And, and nothing good will come from us saying, yeah, I don't need to change. I don't need to pray for my spouse. I'll just change them myself. What did Jesus tell us to pray? Did he tell us to pray, my will be done? No, he said, pray thy will be done. Not for our will, but for the will of God. Psalm 1830 says, as for God, his way is perfect. I love that. It's so simple. As for God, his way is perfect. What does that mean? Write this down. God's plan and will for your spouse is better, far better than your plan and will for your spouse. So pray for his will to be accomplished in the life of your spouse. I know that you and I think we know exactly how our spouse needs to change. We know exactly what needs to happen. But listen, as for God, his way is perfect. His will, his plan for your spouse is far better than yours, unbelievably. So pray for God's will to be accomplished in the life of your spouse. And as you do that, you'll find your own heart turning toward wanting the will of God to be accomplished in your life and just saying, God, whatever it looks like, just let your will be done in my spouse's life and in mine. Get, get us to that place. Write this down now. Marriage wrecking tip number nine. We'll take a turn for the even heavier now. Assume your marriage is a fair proof. Assume your marriage is a fair proof. Take a deep breath. Some of you probably aren't going to breathe for about the next 15 minutes, okay? So despite the fact that extramarital affairs happen all the time, our world seems to have a fundamental misunderstanding about how affairs happen and what leads to them happening. And I feel like a great example of this was the reaction when it came out that, that Mike Pence, who's the Vice President of the United States, a strong Christian, has a personal policy of never having dinner alone with a woman other than his wife. I don't know if you remember when this came out in the media, and he, he was just absolutely ridiculed because people said this is the most antiquated, over-the-top standard. This is like insulting. This is moronic. And, and the best question I heard someone ask when they were writing an editorial about all of this noise that was going on is they said, how do all the people who are making fun of Mike Pence think that affairs start? Like, how do they think affairs start? And it's a great question because based on the mocking Mike Pence received, I can only assume that, that most people think affairs happen the way they do in the movies. There's an instant overpowering attraction between two people and five minutes later, Bob and Sarah are in the janitor's closet. No offense intended if your name is either Bob or Sarah and you're here this evening. But 99% of the time, 99.99% .99 of the time, that's not how affairs happen. Most of the time, there's an emotional connection that develops between two people. And the physical connection is simply the inevitable result of that escalating emotional connection. 
The emotional connection happens as two people discuss increasingly intimate topics with each other, things like struggles they're having in life, troubles they're having in their marriage, things with their spouse that they're dissatisfied with, details of their sex life, etc. And this emotional connection grows until it also manifests in a physical connection. So one of the most common ways affairs happen is when a spouse isn't having their emotional needs met in the marriage and someone else shows up in their life and begins meeting those emotional needs. Now please hear me clearly on this. A spouse not having their emotional needs met in their marriage does not justify them having an affair. I need to be really clear about that. It does not justify it. It does explain it, but it doesn't justify it. It doesn't make it okay. What I want us to understand is that when we choose to not meet our spouse's emotional needs, we put them in a position of greater emotional vulnerability. And conversely, when when we're not having our emotional needs met in our marriage, and we stay silent about it, we need to realize that we are putting ourselves in a more vulnerable emotional state. Write this down and we'll talk about this some more. When I allow a member of the opposite sex other than my spouse to regularly meet an emotional need, I'm putting myself in danger. When I allow a member of the opposite sex other than my spouse to regularly meet an emotional need, I'm putting myself in danger. And you know, Satan loves to fill our mind with the prideful thought of, of come on, come on, nothing's going on. We're just talking. What's wrong with just talking? Read your Bible. James 3.6 has a, a fairly strong opinion about the dangers of ungodly and sinful conversation. Again, let's just decide if this is being vague or being pretty serious here. James 3.6 says this when it comes to just talking. It says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members, so it's placed among the parts of our body, so that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by hell. That's what James says about our speech. It says, listen, where where the tongue is positioned in your body is such a place that if you use it for the wrong things, in dangerous ways, in ways that make you vulnerable, it will set your whole body on fire with the desire to sin. That's what it can do. We're never just talking when we put ourselves in dangerous situations. The Bible doesn't buy that excuse. Like practically every sin that we get involved with, it comes down to the issue of pride. And and we buy into the lie from Satan that we can somehow reach the point of spiritual maturity where we're no longer vulnerable to sin, right? So we've graduated somehow. We've achieved a spiritual status of maturity where, you know, we can now have conversations with members of the opposite sex. They might be too intimate or, or too dangerous for other believers, for younger, lesser, less mature believers, but we're mature enough to handle it. We can just take the good from it and it's gonna have no effect on us. And that is a straight up lie. It's pride masquerading as maturity and Proverbs 16, 18 tells us, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. It's pride, it's the oldest trick in the book that Satan does. You'll never fall for that. Come on, come on, you're above that. I want to share a positive bit of practical advice about meeting your spouse's emotional needs and it's going to be something positive just so that you can breathe and relax for a minute. In one of the parenting books that Charlene and I read back in the day, uh, we learned a great tip about how to respond when your kid brings something to you to show you. The book said that you should always match their enthusiasm because when they were excited about what they made or what they did, your kid decided that you were the person that they wanted to share that excitement with. That's a big deal. That is a big, big deal. And you want to honor that because you want to be the person that your kid shares those things with, right? That's the relationship you want to have with your kids as they grow up. And the same is true in marriage. When when your spouse shares something with you, however stupid or inconsequential it might be, 
you should match their enthusiasm because they decided that you were the person they wanted to share it with. And that's a big deal. And Charlene is great at this, and I'll give you two examples. I send stupid memes and and pictures and articles to her on a regular basis, like instant messaging and stuff. And she laughs with me, or at least she pretends to, because it's not that hard to type ha-ha and send send it back, you know? But she doesn't. She doesn't say, why are you wasting your life? She doesn't do that. She just sends back like, ha-ha-ha, that's so funny. And, and when I get home from, from CrossFit most days, she always asks me, how did it go today? And I walk her through the workout that she did. Now, she does not really care about CrossFit at all, at all. She's pretending. And I know that. But you know what? I really appreciate that she's willing to pretend because I enjoy sharing it with her. And you know what? There's no temptation for me to go and share those details with anybody else of the opposite sex because I get to share them with her. And I share all kinds of stuff with her. Because I know she's going to listen. And I know that she's going to respond because she wants to be that person. Now let me, get, let me get real here, very real. I see a lot of marriages, a lot, where one or spa- both spouses have those topics where they, ju- they just laugh and they say, oh no, they never talk to me about that stuff because they know I don't care. I don't want to hear it. And I want to suggest that that attitude is completely missing the point. Completely missing the point. Missing the big picture. Uh, the point is that when they did something they enjoyed or cared about, they wanted to share it with you. And that's a big deal. It's not about their stupid hobby that you're not interested in. It's not about the conversation they had with their friends that you couldn't care less about. It's not about the TV show that you would rather learn the harp than watch. It's about the fact that they wanted to share it with you. They wanted to share it with you. So pretend to be interested for five minutes. For five minutes. Because you want to be the person that your spouse shares those things with. You know who's doing a good job at this? The wife who goes and watches their husband play a sport that they couldn't care less about. And it's like, yay, score a goal puck touchdown. Go for it. That's great. They don't care at all about the game. But you know what? They, they care about the things their husband cares about. And they want to be involved in their life. This is the husband who watches a stupid romantic comedy with their wife, even though it's borderline unbearable, not because they want to do it, but because their wife wants to share it with them. And these are things where we just roll our eyes and it's so easy to go, no, no, I'm not going to do that with you. It's stupid. That's missing the point. You want to be the person that your spouse shares things with. And if you're constantly saying like, no, I'm not interested in that, you're sending the wrong message. You're sending the wrong message and you're putting them in a place of emotional vulnerability in the event that someone shows up who is interested in those things and is willing to listen. So give them those five minutes. Write this down. If you want to be the person your spouse shares things with, make sure you respond positively when they do, even if you're not really interested in the subject. Even if you're not really interested in the subject. Just pretend They'll, they'll know you're pretending and they won't even care. They won't care because they just want to share it with you. You know, the world might laugh at Mike Pence's boundaries in his marriage, but the truth is he's choosing to protect himself from having an affair by not allowing those first seeds to even have a chance to take root. He's saying, I'm not going to put myself in an environment that is intimate, which may increase the chances of intimate conversation taking place with someone other than my wife. That's common sense wisdom. And the thing that I respect so much about it is that it takes a huge amount of humility to accurately evaluate your own weaknesses and vulnerabilities. The truth is that every marriage needs reasonable boundaries. We know that to err is human. We know that we're all vulnerable to temptation. And so we need to come up with boundaries in our marriages to ensure that we don't put ourselves in situations that we can't resist. Situations where the emotional intimacy is escalating. And I can tell you with 100% confidence that Mike Pence's dinner rule is just one of several boundaries he has in his marriage. And I'm going to risk offending some people and just share some standard practices that I think are just basic common sense for married couples here. Your spouse should always have access to your phone, to your email, to your messaging accounts, anything like that. They should know your password. You shouldn't be offended if they hop on and take a look because there shouldn't be anything to hide. And knowing that they're going to do that will help protect you from making bad decisions. 
You, you don't need that level of privacy. You, you don't. Spouses shouldn't be texting or messaging members of the opposite sex after a certain time of the day. There's just, a, there's just a connotation to the later in the evening you get, you know. Only bad things happen after a certain time, and only bad things should really be happening with your spouse. That's all I'm going to say about that. Now, spouses shouldn't be having casual conversation over the phone or, or text or messaging with members of the opposite sex. I'm not talking about being rude, like if, if someone from work texts you and being like, I can't talk because, you know, you might be trying to entrap me into a sexual affair. Don't, don't do that. But I'm just saying, don't, don't get into conversations or have relationships with members of the opposite text where they text you or, or want to just say, how was your day? Or what's, what's going on with you? What's happening? Because those things, as innocent as they seem, here's what they mean. That person was thinking about you and just wanted to know how your day was going. And that's a level of, of intimacy and care that we're really only supposed to be sharing with our spouse. It's, it's not right. If one spouse is not comfortable with a situation, the other spouse should respect their wishes. I mean, now this is assuming the other spouse is reasonable and not a crazy person. Those are other issues. What I mean is something like me saying to Charlene, hey babe, you know, I'm going to go out and uh, just give like a tennis lesson to Stephanie from my gym this Friday and then we'll probably go out for coffee afterwards. And Charlene says, you know, I'm not really comfortable with that. There's a lot of other places she could get a tennis lesson, and isn't the the coffee thing kind of like a a date? And I should be respectful of her feelings in a situation like that and not just say, whatever, you're imagining things. She's, She's not. She's right. And the issue of boundaries really connects to the biblical admonition of 1 Corinthians 7, 4. It tells us this. It should be on your outlines. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. You do a whole sermon on this, but according to the Bible, according to God, okay? So this is not a style of marriage. This is not a model. If you're a Christian, this is the model. This is how it is to be. According to God, spouses belong to each other. They have ownership of each other. And so the whole idea of I'm just going to do what I want, even if my spouse doesn't like it, it doesn't work with the Bible. You have to reject the authority of God and the authority of the Bible in order to embrace that philosophy in your marriage. You can't do it if you're really following Jesus. If you don't have any boundaries in your marriage, I encourage you to have some conversations and establish some. Remember what we talked about earlier in this series. Expectations need to be articulated and they need to be defined. They need to be defined. Couples need to be on the same page regarding what is and is not acceptable or else you'll only discover that you should have had boundaries when the situation arises and it's too late. You know, peacetime is the best time to strengthen your defenses because if you don't have adequate defenses in place when the attack comes, it might already be too late. It's foolishness to say, we don't need boundaries. We have a strong marriage. Right now, right now, it's the perfect time to establish boundaries and strengthen your defense. Write this down. A healthy marriage needs to have healthy, defined boundaries. Healthy, defined boundaries. Don't think you can rely on common sense. When it comes to temptation and sin, our common sense will fly out the window in a heartbeat. You know, pride is Satan's favorite tactic. It's the sin that got him thrown out of heaven, and he's kind of a pro at using it. And so what Satan will whisper in your ear, again, is just, come on. Come on, you don't need boundaries. Your faith is rock solid. You're not not a child who needs rules. You'd never have an affair. And, And if Satan can get you to buy into that whole, I'd never do that line of thinking, he's off to a great start. He's off to a great start. He's practically got you. In Proverbs 6, Solomon is writing to his son about the dangers of getting into an affair. And he writes this. He says, can a man take fire to his bosom, to his chest, and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot coals and his feet not be seared? So Satan plays to our pride and he says, sure you can. Sure you can. You just need a little warmth, a little attention, a sympathetic ear to listen to you. But the Bible says that, that that little bit of warmth and comfort you're seeking is like, is like picking up a hot coal from the fire and holding it against your chest and saying, oh, 
so nice and warm, but what's going to happen? You're going to get burned. You're going to get burned. Satan's going to be patient. He's not going to have that temptation or that person. And I've, I've seen this so many times. Satan's not going to have that person show up in your life when your faith is rock solid and strong. He's not going to do that because he's smart. What Satan's going to do is he's going to wait until your marriage is under pressure. He's going to wait until you're in a season when you feel disconnected from your spouse. He's going to bide his time and wait for the moment when your marriage is at its most vulnerable. And then all of a sudden, that person's going to show up. Or that person who's been there a while, you're suddenly going to see them in a different way. You're suddenly going to connect. You're suddenly going to click. And it'll never be a coincidence the time that it happens at. And that's why we need boundaries. You don't need them for the days that you're strong. You need them for the days when you're weak and vulnerable. And trust me, there will be those days. There will. The problem, and this is going to get very, very real right here. Don't worry, I will not ask for a show of hands at any time during this point, okay? The problem is that most of us assess and evaluate ourselves with this sort of thought. I'd never have an affair, which really means I'd never initiate an affair. It means I, I would never like try to kiss someone other than my spouse. I'd never make a move like that. And that might be true, and that's usually how we think about it. But what we fail to consider is the question, what if they initiate it? See, the real question is, what if they make a move? Would you stop them? That's a very, very different question. And there might be people in your life where the reality is you'd never initiate anything, but you know deep down that if they did, you probably wouldn't stop them. That's a very, very different question. I've also heard it worded this way. Is there anyone you'd have an affair with if you could be guaranteed that you'd get away with it? Again, don't worry. Don't put your hand up. That's not an actual question. And the reason I share this is, is to hopefully illuminate for all of us the reality that uh, we're all vulnerable. And we're all sinners who are capable of sinning, even though you don't want to believe this about yourself. You and I are capable of sinning in far worse ways than we could imagine. If there's one thing about myself that's astounded me year after year, it's my own sinfulness. It's astounding, the, the depth of my depravity, the issues that I still battle, the thoughts that still enter my head that I struggle with. If there's one thing I'm absolutely sure about myself, it's that I am vulnerable to sin. I am absolutely confident of that, not uncertain in any way. And so I have a responsibility to the Lord and to my wife to do my best to structure my life in a way that minimizes the opportunities for me to fall into sin. And that's the single biggest reason we need boundaries in our marriage. We are vulnerable to sin. If you ever think that you've somehow spiritually graduated from being vulnerable to sin, all it means is Satan's got you. He's got you completely hoodwinked and you don't even see it. He's managed to bait you with pride and he's just reeled you into the perfect position for you to be blindsided by temptation. Hebrews 11 is a, a chapter in the Bible that's known as the Hall of Faith because it contains the names and, and the abbreviated stories of many of the greatest men and women in the Bible who demonstrated incredible faith. And one of the people listed is Moses, and I'll read to you what Hebrews 11 says about him. It says, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. So even though Moses was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter as an infant, he chose to leave that life to be associated with the Israelites because they were God's people and because Moses was more concerned about being rich in eternity than being rich on the earth. But what I want us to notice is that phrase that I put on your outline, the passing pleasures of sin, the passing pleasures of sin. And one of the things that, that we as the church don't do a good job of, especially with our kids, is acknowledging the reality that sin is pleasurable. It is not a good tactic with your children to try and convince them that sin is not fun and that's why we shouldn't sin because it's just not true. Sin is tons of fun. Why do you think we're always tempted to do it? It's not like, oh man, that would really suck to do that. Uh, I, re I really want to do it. I'll do it anyway though. It's because it's fun and one of, the, one of the realities is that what wisdom does is it looks past 
that temporary season down the road to see the results of sin once the pleasures have passed. That's what wisdom enables you to do, to look all the way to the end of the process. When we do that, we make wise decisions. When we're tempted by something like an affair, what Satan does is he just fills our minds with thoughts of all the passing pleasures as though they will be all there is to the story, the beginning and the end. Pleasure in the middle and pleasure at the end. That's all Satan wants us to think about. However, we know that there's a different ending to the story. We know. The Bible says, be sure. In other words, take it to the bank. Your sin will find you out. It'll come for you. The results and the consequences will come for you. They will. The Bible says it's a guarantee. And so, if you want an exercise in wisdom... Begin by just running through a mental list of what the realistic fallout of a marital affair is. What it's really like. When an affair seems exciting and and sexy, just begin to think about all these fantastic benefits like having to confess to your spouse when it inevitably comes out one day. Having to satisfy their curiosity by going through every excruciating detail because they're going to want to know. And then imagine having to watch them break down and be completely devastated by your betrayal. And then imagine the conversation you're going to have to have with the other person's spouse. Because that's going to happen. Imagine having to face your friends and your family and your church when it comes out. Because it will. It will. Imagine having to explain the situation to your kids. Because they're going to need to know what the heck is going on. Imagine the the possible divorce and how that's going to wreck your life on on multiple levels, multiple levels. Imagine having to to work through the guilt and the shame and imagine the years of rebuilding trust in the marriage, which is still easier than carrying all of that junk into a new marriage. The list of consequences isn't very sexy. It's not very fun. It's not very wild and carefree, but it is accurate. Because it's the whole story. It's what happens after the passing pleasures of sin. Twice in the book of Proverbs, the same verse is repeated word for word, and it's this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. To me, that's one of the most profound verses in the Bible. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. I deserve this. My spouse takes me for granted. I can't be blamed for doing this. Seems right. We can justify it in our own mind. Is it incredible the things that we can justify in our own mind? The behavior, the sin? And the Bible says, hey, you can make it seem right in your own mind. It's not going to change the fact that the end is death, destruction. Our feelings are full of it. We said this last week. They lie to us all the time. So don't ever make rash decisions because something feels right. Do you know that the reason we have the word of God is because our emotions can't be trusted to tell us the truth. Our memory can't be trusted to tell us the truth. That's why we need the word of God in black and white because no matter how we're feeling, it still says the same thing. No matter how bad we want to justify our sin, it still says the same thing. So weigh what you're thinking about doing against the word of God. Think beyond the passing pleasures to the full consequences and act wisely, act wisely. Final tip I'm going to share today, marriage wrecking tip number 10. Make a note of this. Make your spouse your God. Great way to wreck your marriage. Make your spouse your God. Just expect that your spouse is going to give you purpose and meaning. Expect your your spouse to calm every nervous thought and bit of anxiety that you have. Expect your spouse to give you all the self-esteem you need. Expect your spouse to be a sufficient source of joy and happiness. 
All the things the Bible says we're to get from God, you can get from your spouse. Just think about these encouraging verses that you may be familiar with. The righteous cry out and their spouse hears and delivers them out of all of their troubles. Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to your spouse, and the peace of your spouse, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through your spouse. Or Proverbs 3, trust in your spouse with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge them, and they shall direct your paths. We're being facetious, but but the point is very, very real. Many spouses are expecting their spouse to meet needs that only God can. And the tragedy is that it's absolutely impossible for anybody's spouse to do that. It's impossible. When we expect our spouse to do what only God can do, we're inevitably crushed with disappointment because they let us down, they fail us. And then we decide that they're not doing a good job loving us, so they must not love us. And our spouse is also crushed because the weight and the burden of being responsible for somebody else's self-esteem, happiness, and purpose in life is just too much for any human being to bear. The only relationships that don't mind that sort of arrangement are defined as being dysfunctional because they're codependent relationships. You know the kind where they're madly in love and making out one second and then throwing the food and the plates at each other the next, calling the cops one second and then bailing their spouse out and punching the cop as they take them away. That's sort of just absolute disaster of a relationship. And why does it do that? Because for one moment, the spouse is meeting all of their needs, but it's impossible for them to do that all the time. So when they don't, everything completely falls apart. Now I'm assuming that we don't want to be in a dysfunctional, codependent train wreck of a marriage. And so we need to understand that we can't place our spouse in the position of God and ask them to do what only God can and meet needs that only God can. And while every spouse obviously should endeavor to bless their spouse as much as possible, it is not your spouse's job to be exclusively responsible for your happiness for your self-esteem, for your inner peace, for your joy, for your sense of purpose and meaning. Those verses actually go like this. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Don't make your spouse your God. You're going to be disappointed and you're going to crush them as well under the weight of that expectation. In God's toolbox of sanctification, marriage is one of the most powerful tools It's meant to change us. It's meant to shape us. It's meant to make us more like Jesus. Marriage also gives us a practical way to show our love and devotion to Jesus. But Jesus is easy to love. My spouse isn't. Newsflash, neither are you. Neither are you. And he loves you anyway. He loves you anyway. And what he said is, if you love me, love your spouse. Love your spouse the way that I love you. Jesus is saying to us, show me that you get it. Show me that you understand that I love you even though you don't deserve it. Show me that you get that by loving your spouse that way. Show me that you understand. So let's make it our goal to love our spouse as well because God knows he's loved us well. He's loved us well. Let's welcome his work in our lives even when he does it through our marriage. And let's pray for his will rather than our will to be accomplished in the life of our spouse. And let's show our care for our marriages by establishing wise boundaries that will protect us from external dangers and vulnerabilities. And let's let's be humble enough to acknowledge that we are vulnerable, that we need those boundaries. And let's make sure that we never replace the Lord with our spouse, expecting our spouse to do what only the Lord can. Now perhaps as we've shared this The Holy Spirit has been highlighting one of those issues I just mentioned. 
And you know that he really wants you to hear and respond to that one issue. If that's what's going on, would you just welcome his work in your life tonight, tomorrow, and, and going forward? And I'm going to say this as well. It's not, it's not in my notes, but, but if you're a believer, I don't know where you are, but for me, there's nothing more serious for me than when I know that God is telling me to do something because the fear of the Lord kicks in and I'm scared to not do it. I'm scared to not do it. And there have been multiple times in my marriage. There, there was one this week. There was one this week. Didn't want to go apologize. Didn't want to go fix it. And the Holy Spirit literally said, go fix it. And I stood still and I argued with the Holy Spirit for at least 60 seconds. He didn't change his mind, surprisingly. And I went and, and I fixed it. And I fixed it. Not, not, not because I'm, I'm, I'm great at that, but because the Holy Spirit blessed the fact that I responded to what he was asking me to do. And he showed me grace in that situation. And he poured grace um, on my marriage. Remember what we said last week. The Bible says God gives grace to the humble. And so firstly, I just hope if you're a follower of Jesus that you have enough fear of the Lord to dare not say no to him when you know he's asking you to do something. Because if you're in that place, you, you don't need to be evaluating your marriage. You need to be evaluating whether or not you're a follower of Jesus. It's a very different question. It's a very serious question. But God forbid any of us be in the place where we know that God is asking us to do something and we're just saying no. Fear God. Fear God. Don't play around. Fear God. It's a serious, serious thing. And to encourage you in that area, it says he gives grace to the humble. And when you humble yourself and you say, God, I will do what you're asking me to do, even when you don't want to do it, that's irrelevant whether you want to do it or not. When you do it, when you humble yourself before God, God says, I'm going to pour grace on this situation. Take a step forward in obedience to God and see what happens. See what he does. See how he blesses it. Everything the Lord desires for us, everything he desires to do in us is for our good. There's nothing that God will ever ask you to do that is not for your ultimate good. So welcome his work in your life. Welcome his work in your marriage. It, it's for your own good. Let's pray. Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Uh, Father, thank you so much for your word. And, and thank you that you haven't just told us, hey, listen, I invented marriage. It's going to do some good stuff. Good luck with that. Th thank you that you spoke to us through your word and have given us a model in your son Jesus of what it means to love sacrificially, to love in humility and, and to genuinely serve others. And so Holy Spirit, we wanna just welcome your work in our lives. And I, I pray that if there is any among us that needs to respond to you in a specific area that you would make it clear and that we would have the wisdom, the humility, but also the fear of God enough to dare not say no to you. To recognize that if you're asking us to do something, it's the very best thing that we could do. It's the thing that's going to benefit us the most, even though it may require humility. God, help us to do it. Help us to trust and believe what we know is true. That you care about our marriages and you want good for us. You want what is best for us. You want to bless our marriages. So help us to welcome your work in our lives and in our marriages, Jesus. Just speak to us, God.